the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Elephant in the Dark by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The late abbot of Downside, author of Western Mysticism, Butler, Dom Cuthbert, London, Grey Arrow, 1960, which is regarded as something of a classic, clearly states that, placing himself definitely in the point of view of Catholic theology, God can give particular revelations and mystical gifts to Muslim mystics. He defines what is needed, from the Christian point of view, to make it possible for such events to come about. Only the enlightening motion, wholly interior, which should put his mind in perfect consonance with the supernatural revealed truth, the grace of faith which God refuses to no sincere mind, which is the proposed object of faith. In this he echoes the spirit of a passage about devotion in the Quran, which refers to worship becoming, as it were, a texture of man's actions and thoughts. In the places of worship which God hath allowed to be raised, that his name may therein be remembered, so men praise him in the morning and in the evening, men who neither merchandising nor traffic diverts from the remembrance of God and the keeping up of prayer. Quran 24, 36 and 37 And is there a stage, from the point of Christians, where understanding of surrender in spirit and language can come to pass? Certainly Father Cyprian Rice, the Dominican author, in a book which has the nihil obstat and imprimatur of the Dominican and diocesan authorities in Rome, Rice Cyprian O.P., The Persian Sufis, London, Allen and Unwin, 1964, looks forward to such an understanding. Whatever one's preconceptions or reservations, he says, it is difficult not to recognise a kinship between the Sufi spirit and vocabulary and those of the Christian saints and mystics. He is certainly not looking for a derivative pattern with Islamic ideas taken from Christianity as so many other workers have tried to sustain. No evidence for this derivation has so far been adduced, and indeed Father Rice himself says, it is difficult to trace any scriptural or literary evidence of the propagation of Christian teaching on Islamic mystical writers. That the experiences of the desert monks in the Middle East still provide a powerful concept for the resumption of understanding based on a devotional spirit is shown by a recent monograph in Sufi Studies East and West, New York, Dutton, 1973, written by the eminent Coptic lay churchman Judge Hilmi Makram Ebed. In his Possibilities of Eastern Moral Influence on Modern Civilization, he reminds us of the original identity of interests of the Muslims and the Christian monks of the Egyptian deserts, whose numbers, he says, may have at times exceeded half a million of several nationalities. Their tradition lives on. The Christian community of Egypt today numbers about four million. Dr. Abayid, in invoking the long-standing and powerful bonds between the Egyptian Christians and their Muslim fellow countrymen, concludes with the general assertion that the revitalization of spiritual life in the modern world may well come through Islamic sources. Father Rice, as a Catholic, echoes this feeling where he looks forward to a special future role for Islamic spirituality, as, he says, to make possible a welding of religious thought between East and West, a vital ecumenical commingling and understanding, which will prove ultimately to be, in the truest sense, on both sides, a return to origins, to the original unity. 
A man with a devout Protestant background, with parents who made their children Christians, was the late Professor A. J. Arbery of Cambridge, who consecrated most of his working life to the investigation of Islamic devotional literature, more especially of Sufi mysticism. His feelings about the future of cooperation between East and West in the study and development of this subject are very plainly put in this passage. It is far from useless to look back into the pages of the distant past. Whether we are Muslims or not, we are surely children of one Father, and it is therefore no impertinence, no irrelevancy for the Christian scholar to aim at rediscovering those vital truths which made the Sufi movement so powerful an influence for good. If he may have the cooperation of his Muslim colleagues in this research, and the signs are not wanting that he will, together they may hope to unfold a truly remarkable and inspiring history of high human endeavour. Together they may succeed in retracing a pattern of thought and behaviour which will supply the needs of many seeking the re-establishment of moral and spiritual values in these dark and threatening times. Like Dr. Abayid, Dr. Arbery leaves us in no doubt that the Sufi heritage may, in his belief and in his words, meet the requirements of the modern and future man. Arbery A.J. Sufism, London, Allen & Unwin, 1963 If some of these fervent and hopeful aspirations are thought over-enthusiastic, it can only be said that people will find in a subject that which corresponds to their own bias, at least initially. It seems possible that with the wide-ranging familiarisation with varieties of Christian and Muslim religious experience and writing, that a balance of understanding may be struck. It is unfortunately true today, as during any time in the past, that individuals and coteries, basing their view upon narrow experience and perhaps even narrower, though concealed, prejudices, present their own religions and those of others with what amounts to distortion. The effects of this must be put down to psychology, Some of it may even be a clinical responsibility. Currently, in the East and West, there is so much publication and misinformation that only extensive reading will enable the student to form a useful opinion. Few Western readers, of course, reading many contemporary works on Islam and particularly in the mystical area, will be able to perceive, unless they have this sound grounding, that many of the writers, while genuflecting towards objectivity, are in fact ideologists, pursuing personal vendettas or biases, or trying to create a climate for the ultimate projection of a certain exclusive point of view, or worse, though fortunately rarer, seeking personal prominence, precisely what Ghazali warns against in his abysmal valley. Several Eastern propagandists, some of them occupying scholarly posts of one kind or another, use up much ink in attacking Western workers. There is certainly some ground for pointing out the unbalanced picture, created by personal bias in such figures as Nicholson, whose attraction for Rumi and Sufism is in conflict with several forms of opposition, creating a bizarre dichotomy. For example, his belief that Sufis attack Islam Selected Poems from the Divani Shamsi Tabriz, Cambridge University Press, 1952 edition, that it is not surprising that the Sufis should lack the psychological richness and variety which is found in Western mysticism. The idea of personality in Sufism, Lahore, 1964, that Hudwiri was neither a profound mystic nor a precise thinker. He also states, in violation of all Sufi thought, that Sufis reached a purer religion and a higher morality than Islam could offer them, in The Legacy of Islam, 1968 edition. As I say, this balance can be redressed without intensive personal attacks, by familiarity with the whole spectrum of the materials. Again, current vogues for what people are pleased to call mysticism, 
but what are in fact more easily explained as, in general, sociological phenomena, cause a confusing situation for many. The occultist-minded and less informed tend to read or absorb selectively, and choose agreeable, to them, passages even more selectively. They are victims of two things. One, lack of a good grounding of information, and two, the confusion by well-meant but maladroit literature. In the second category come some quite hilarious developments. Surrender to God must mean a search for truth and a corresponding diminution of egotism. Some of the present-day writers and speakers on this subject are so palpably motivated by egotism, and the process has gone so far, that the disciple of one man known as a spiritual teacher once shouted at me, I have been told by my teacher not to listen to anyone, and when he tells me to do something, I do it. When I explained to him that if he was not to listen to anyone, he should not listen to his teacher, he was at first quite astonished. Because there had been so much talk of occultism and Sufism, I devoted a great deal of time in the Sufis to showing how occultist aspirations, based on transient greed for power and knowledge, were unworthy and ineffective, and also in many cases stemmed only from the uncritical acceptance of a distorted tradition. It was, in the event, just as well that I did so. This has enabled me for nearly ten years to dissolve the aspirations of people who approach Islamic mysticism as if it were some sort of magical system which would give them power of enlightenment without training and discipline. It has been responsible for making it possible to shed those people who are in fact clinical cases and not primarily seekers after truth. But as fast as one manages to establish this principle, fresh recruits, drawn from the readers of the real occultists, including people who think that they have a religious bias and will not investigate and describe the distortions which they are unconsciously provoking and perpetuating while overtly opposing them, fresh recruits, brandishing these so-called serious books, their hopes inflamed, clamour to be taught secrets. This merry-go-round has reached such proportions that I have to deal with an average of 30 letters a day, many from the readers of the serious books who have not had any opportunity of learning about the trivial, misunderstood and vestigial nature of their metaphysics. But while we are on this subject, it really must be stressed that this phenomenon is not new. Approximately a thousand years ago, Ali al-Hujwiri, in his Kashf al-Majub, Revelation of the Veiled, now recognized as a Sufi classic, emphasized that there were many mere imitators and people who practiced what they imagined to be ecstatogenic processes without a suitable context. Fortunately, by the process which is known these days as feedback, measuring and assessing the results of what one does by people's reactions, it is possible to see these developments at work. Those who, failing to go a sufficient distance towards surrender to God, whether they be Christians or Muslims, can easily be shown, more especially in the light, too, of modern psychology, for what they are. This yields instructive study material with which we can demonstrate superficial and subjective states to honest enquirers, and there are indications that the initiators of such petty activities themselves can be reached by a similar method. There is a ragbag of Eastern and Western individuals who specialise in making a good deal of noise in attempting to capture the attention of both Christians and Muslims for their peculiar brands of mystical study. Their efforts could only succeed to any extent at all if they themselves succeeded in confining students' attention to their own writings and activities. Any reasonable degree of familiarization for the student with the whole range of available material, in the case of the Sufis with the major Sufi classics, which exist in translation, will at once show up the narrowness and selectivity of their pretensions. 
Even unreliable translations give enough material to fulfill this function. The danger here, of course, is that the common human desire to seek a system, a limiting framework through which to work, an ideology which will apparently answer all questions, may tempt numbers of otherwise far more flexible, far-sighted and useful individuals to narrow their perspectives to one or more of the formulations which are offered by these would-be experts, whose main distinguishing characteristic is often that, in selecting one contention about mysticism, they automatically ignore another, equally valid or emphatic one, said, written or practised by our major teachers. In the manifestation of the surrender to God as a way to salvation, therefore, the problem remains what it has always been, to avoid total generalisation as much as total narrowing of doctrine. This is not easy to learn and to practice, but it undoubtedly distinguishes the great teachers from the would-be ones, the ones with interior perception of truth, from those who imagine that they have it because they happen to specialise in this or that in other words, who have adopted an egotistical posture and seek to defend it by attacking other people and peddling a partial account of mystical information. Thus, knowledge and understanding are vitally important prerequisites to the ability to surrender. A person does not surrender to God in the sense in which this technical term is used by Christians and Muslims, merely by becoming a consumer of ideas or emotions. There is a serious danger that the presentation of the surrender concept may take on a titillating aspect where all that is stimulated is the amour propre, where, above all, something which is a very definite procedure is mistaken for a somewhat easy golden key. Modern psychology has done us the service of stating baldly that there must be a difference between modesty and masochism. And as an example of how lack of information, or hinting in a certain manner, can arouse uncritical and even absurd expectations, I would like to give you an analogy from recent experience. A little while ago, I began a talk in London with these words. There is a country where, for centuries, people have drunk, often first thing in the morning, a decoction of a certain dried herb, which they cause to be brought from distant and, to them, little-known lands. Many of them believe that they would not be able to manage their lives unless they consumed this nostrum regularly. They have fought wars over it, and in time of war they have taken immensely complicated and hazardous pains to ensure its continued supply. At this point, someone stood up and said, What is this place? What is this herb? Can we get any? And would it be useful to us? Can we visit the country where it is used? There was a rustle of approval from the audience. This was what was in the minds of many, if not all, of them. I noticed that well over two-thirds of them seemed to be sitting on the edge of their seats. Well, as I said at that time, yes. We can get the herb, and it is useful to us. We are already in the country, and the plant is called tea. At that time, in Britain, this unknown substance, tea, was being imported at the rate of £500 million per annum. Every year, each man, woman and child in those islands, and in my audience, was already consuming every year the decoction of seven pounds of the stuff. One might say that such an experiment, which I and others have performed many times, is certain when carried out among credulous, greedy, gullible people, to produce a reaction like this. I entirely agree, which brings me to the real point of the story. I have not yet told you who the audience were. The people at that lecture, who numbered over 200 individuals, were all, so far as could be determined, people who had come to listen to a talk about the relationship of man with God, the possibility of self-improvement through faith, bases of approaches to true humility. They had been selected from among groups of people who, for many years, 
had convinced themselves that they were seekers of truth, and certainly had had no hand in the shaping of the background of their thinking. They were an audience of people who believed that they were following the teachings, the writings and the traditions of Christian mysticism. In the absence of some kind of feedback, they had apparently not reached the point where they had overcome or attenuated to any very visible degree their very superficial greed, literally, for some kind of nostrum. If people who are not sympathetic towards the religious perspective were to replicate such an experiment, they would not use it as we do, as an admonition. They would, and many have, use it as a proof that spirituality is a form of greed. The teaching by both Christians and Muslims over the centuries, that it is not enough to seek God, but that he must be sought in a certain way, and that, if this is not understood, it can be said to be worse than no search at all, since the search can merely nurture greed, these teachings had, in respect to those people, gone by the board. Some Sufi mystics in Islam have been fiercely criticized for allegedly forbidding their disciples to perform pilgrimages or carry out other holy activities until they were in a state in which they would not only benefit, but would not suffer through feeding the wrong part of themselves with a spurious experience. Yet if you verify this sort of experiment for yourself, and there is no need to rely upon my statements, for your experimental material is everywhere, you will come to understand the thinking behind such strictures. Neither the teacher of religion nor the would-be practitioner dares, if he is in his right mind, to develop hypocrisy or abet its development by failing to observe the primary necessities, the prerequisites, for an attempt at surrender to God. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.